Hi, this is Olympic bronze medalist in judo, Marty Malloy, and you're listening to Martial Arts World Radio. Welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. I'm your host, Joseph Clark. Each episode, we speak to the biggest names in martial arts and combat sports, from the UFC, Bellator, the Olympics, as well as martial arts legends, pioneers, and cinema stars. We discuss best practices, perspectives, and philosophies, using martial arts as a metaphor for life's challenges. Over the next hour, we have the following four guest interviews. World champion kickboxing pioneer and action film star, Benny the Jet Yurkidas, from an interview I recorded with him in Los Angeles while we grabbed some Chinese food around the corner from his dojo. UFC fighter Willie Gates talks to us about realizing his personal best and fight psychology. And bodyguard to the stars and consultant to military, prison guards, and police forces, Master Chuck Platten. And Bellator fighter Ryan Couture son of UFC legend and action star Randy Couture, as Ryan prepares for Bellator 180. Welcome to our latest syndication affiliate, Radio Vibe. Martial Arts World Radio connects with audiences through distinctive and compelling guests and content across radio, online, and mobile platforms. If you would like to add your station to our network, or if you would like to advertise on the show and sponsor our Celebrity Fighter interviews, reach out to me at producer at mawradio.com. This week's inspirational quote is from Oscar Wilde and goes as follows. Be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. Irish playwright Oscar Wilde, 1854 to 1900. Our interview with UFC and Bellator fighter Willie Gates is brought to you by BobWallWorldBlackBelt.com the world's foremost online martial arts and MMA marketplace. Prospect Fighting Championships. Check them out at www.prospectfights.com. And the books The Tao of MMA and 21st Century Perspectives on Martial Arts. Both books are available at Amazon by searching The Tao of MMA and 21st Century Perspectives on Martial Arts. Willie Whoopass Gates, born January 21st, 1987, is an American mixed martial artist who has competed in the flyweight division of the UFC and Bellator. He is 5 foot 8 inches tall, weighing in at 125 pounds. Fighting out of Fontana, California, he has a record of 12 wins and 7 losses. Willie, thanks for joining us and welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. How you doing? Glad to be here, guys. So, Willie, beginning with the end in mind, at what age did you begin martial arts? I believe I first walked into a mixed martial arts gym around the age of 24, 25. And what was it that drew you to the sport? Um, actually, I had no idea about UFC, mixed martial arts, until uh, a, a buddy of mine was actually getting into Muay Thai. And then um, he just asked me to come down and join the gym one day, and I, I tried that out. And, kind of got good at it, and just, I was hooked ever since then. So what was it, Willie, that inspired or motivated you to compete? Um, just, just something that I never thought I, I would be interested in, and then it just caught my attention, and uh, I felt that I can, I, can, I can be somebody at this, and I can be good at this, and um, I'm a competitive person as it is, so it was just already in my nature, my blood, and so I just went on and tried it out. Did you compete as an amateur? Uh, yeah, I had a um, well. Back when I started, they didn't have amateur fights. They just had kind of smokers or just hey, meet us at the gym at three o'clock and let's get it on. But uh, okay. uh, other than that, uh, I did I did about five of those. So uh, I believe I went five and zero oh in smokers or amateurs, whatever one you want to call them. So then after that, I was about a year. Then so I a year went on, and I figured, all right, hey, I think I'm kind of good at this. So let me try and go professional. Is there a particular area in mixed martial arts that you lean more towards, or is there a foundation martial art that you prefer? Yeah, I had no idea what mixed martial arts was, or I, I never wrestled karate. I didn't do any of that as a child. So, and I guess 
what I was known for or good at was really just stand up. So I can just stay with boxing. And growing up, were you aware of the golden age of martial arts? And were you a fan of martial art films? Jean Claude Van Damme, Chuck Norris, Bruce Lee. Yeah, yeah, Bruce Lee. Everybody knew Bruce Lee, but I, I didn't. I would never consider myself fighting or even picking up a martial arts at the time. But you know, I guess it just found me. So, Willie, as you became a professional mixed martial artist, what would a day of training look like for you? Living, breathing, mixed martial arts in the gym 24-7, you know, just trying to better my craft, really. So it sounds like you were hooked. Uh, yeah, for the most part, when I first started off, and then, you know, I just grew from there. Really, I was always in the gym, just looking, just finding out artists and new fighters and champions and everybody. Did you have people who motivated you or who were inspirations, role models growing up? Uh, not necessarily growing up. Like like I said, I, it just mixed martial, arts, mixed martial arts just slapped me in the face one day. You know, I didn't really know anything about it. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, actually, I wanted to be an actor, so it was just two totally different worlds I was living in. And, you know, I just started pursuing mixed martial arts first. I, I can say I was a John Paul Van Damme uh, fan, though. Chuck Norris, you know, I was, everybody has to love those guys. And now, as a professional mixed martial artist, do you have people in your life who motivate or inspire you? Uh, I could just say my, my coaches and uh, teammates, you know, you always have somebody better or that you want to be or that inspires you to be better or push yourself. And So I would give that out to my coaches and my teammates at the time. So, Willie, would you walk us through and share with us the chain of events that led to you being called up by the UFC? Well, yeah, it was just kind of a, a snowball effect, really. Like, I just went from one second fighting on a local circuit to just taking these last-minute fights and just taking advantage of it and, and capitalizing on it. And, you know, just one second, you know, just an average show, the next you know you're fighting on the biggest stage. So when the UFC reached out to your manager, Willie, what was going through your head? What emotion were you feeling when you found out that you were being called to fight in the UFC? I was nervous, happy, scared, just, you know, like it was, it was a lot. Like I didn't, it was, it just came fast. It came too fast. Actually. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really expect it at the time, you know, for, for me to get a call up to the UFC. So I just, I had to take it slow because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think it would come. Willie, if I was in your shoes and I got that call, I would probably be asking myself, am I ready yet? Have I earned it? Do I deserve to be here? Did any of those questions go through your mind at the time? Um, no, most definitely. I, it, it ran through my mind, like, you know, should you be here? Like, you know, are you ready for this? Like, you know, like, you know, just a little self-doubt, you know, something that I wish I'd never had at first, but... It was something that was just rambling on in my mind, just because, for the simple fact, like I said, I, one second I'm at the local circuit, like knowing that, oh, well, you know, if I keep on doing this maybe two, three years, you know, I'll be ready for the UFC. And then have to turn around and be like, no, you got like two months to get ready for this. Willie, I think for most of us to doubt ourselves is to be human. It's a very common thing. How did you work through that in order to prevail? Well, like, I, I kind of just, you have to push through it, you know. I'm 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 strong willed and you know, I just have to push through it and just keep on going because, you know, I'm a fighter. I'm a fighter at heart and you know, it's just that willpower that just kept me through it. Like like I said, I, I even started off my career on two, you know, so me starting off like that, just already thinking like, Is this for me? Should I be fighting? Like, you know, you're not good enough and you know, turning that around to a, a winning record and then Winning a couple more fights, and now I'm at the top of I'm at the top of the heap, you know. So it, that was another motivation of mine because I didn't start off too good, and then I kept on going and I kept on pushing myself, and you know I'm, I beat myself out, and now look at me, you know. Willie, it's only natural when you get some good news such as an opportunity like that to be called up to the UFC that you're going to want to tell your friends and family and share that good news. And of course the price you pay for that is you are now in the spotlight. 
and there's this expectation to perform, and you no doubt, like any of us, want so badly to please them and to impress them, and they're all watching you on fight day. So, of course, that's a very nervous situation. Tell us how you dealt with that and, and mentally how you approached those expectations that were on you. Well, the, the first fight is it's always a toss-up, you know, because you never really know, you know. I think the first fight should be the easiest because if you win it, then you win it, you know. Especially in my, my case, it was last minute, so it was kind of like, hey, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. But, hey, you better be damned you did it, you know. So I just went out there, you know. You know of course, I took my first fight short notice. I lost to John Miranda, so it was, it was like, ah, you know, he was number two in the world, you know, like, Took him to uh, the third round or second round or third third round, like you did good, like you know. So it's like okay, you're getting some encouragement, but then back in my mind, it's like no, I could have won this fight. You know, I should have won, you know, but it was okay that I did lose, or you know, because it was short notice. But like that's not really an excuse to that, but people fly that. So Willie, doing some soul searching here, after that first fight. When the crowd had dispersed, when you were back in your hotel room and you reflected on the fight, were you able to say to yourself, I left it all in the octagon? Or, out of nervousness and just the new guy factor, did you hold back on that fight? Or did you give it your all? No. Um, I held back. I never felt that. Like, if you ever fought or competed and you knew that, hey, I'd done the best I could. I couldn't go anymore. I couldn't be any stronger. I couldn't be any faster. I couldn't be any better. Like, that's who I was at, at the peak. You can't be mad at yourself because you couldn't go any further, you know. But me, I, I felt that I could have done more. I, I could have capitalized on certain situations that I didn't capitalize on. So you, you typically pinpoint those and, and you eat yourself at that because, you know, you could have done better. So what did you take away from that experience, and what did you tell yourself to prepare yourself for that second fight? Just tell yourself that, you know, you deserve to be here. You're here for a reason, you know, and go out there and prove yourself. And, you know, my next fight, I, I um, had to take the fight on actually fighting my teammate, you know, somebody that I, I started with from, you know, from almost day one of me stepping into a gym. So I had to necessary pull those emotions aside and, and to actually show the world like you know I deserve to be here and I fought uh, there at Montague and I ended up winning um, winning that fight uh, via TKO so it felt a little better but it, it, like I said it was it was like a bittersweet moment at the time because I had to take it I had to go in there and fight a friend it's not a necessary teammate not a training partner like uh, a friend and that was kind of tough for me to go in there and do that but you know at the end of the day we got a job to do Willie, would you share with us your perspective and your philosophy on pursuing personal excellence and becoming a champion? Pretty much, you got to put you got to put your heart into it. You know, you got to put everything that you can, and you got to push yourself. You got to be better. You got you, you got to be obsessed. You got to be crazy. You know, you got to be driveful. You just got to be. You got to be your life, like you know. Especially if you want to be a champion at this level, like you have to, and that's why. I, Felt that you know I messed up because I, I had so many other distractions in my life and I was dealing with so much stuff and so so many other things that was turning me away from what I needed to focus on and it showed in my performances. Are there challenges now in life outside of the octagon that you're better equipped to take on as a result of your experience as a mixed martial artist? Uh, most definitely, you know. But like I said, you know. Um, I was dealing with them at the time, and it affected me and my performance. So, you know, I just got to start back from a square run and then show them that, you know, I really did deserve to be there. Maybe I wasn't really fully prepared to be there at the time, but, hey, mm -hmm. man, I'm back and I'm ready. Willie, many of my guests, Jason Jackson, Don the Dragon Wilson, Bob Wall, they'll tell us that the challenges in the ring or the challenges in the octagon are easy compared to the challenges in life. You know, losing somebody, overcoming grief, uh, dealing with relationships, these are challenges that are very complex as, as compared to the challenges in the octagon. Would you agree with that? Well, yeah, definitely, because, you know, that's life. And, and you know, life is forever, and then 
whatever you're doing in the octagon, it's only 15 to 25 minutes, so it's temporary. So losing someone versus a fight is, you know, you can't compare. But, you know, but it's still a challenge, and life is challenging, and something that you just got to overcome, and you have to overcome some situations in, in life, and you got to overcome some situations in a fight. So in, in a sense, it's all the same, you know. And Willie, as we bring our interview to a close, would you impart some words of wisdom for our listeners who are young martial artists or new to mixed martial arts and are hoping to become a professional or hopefully someday fight in Bellator or the UFC? Just give it your all. If it's something that you really want to do and you want to pursue, like just make sure you, you do it 100% so you have no doubt if you fail or succeed in it. This has been an interview with UFC and Bellator fighter Willie Whoopass Gates. This is UFC fighter Jason Sago. You are now listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. Sunday, June 25th, UFC fighter Alex Ricci is hosting a Muay Thai seminar at Bruce County Combat in Walkerton, Ontario, Canada. Everyone is welcome, no experience necessary. It's from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., $25 per person. Contact Bruce County Combat and Fitness for more information at 519-507-4431 or email them at brucecountycombat at gmail.com. Our interview with Master Chuck Platten is brought to you by Cayenne Independent Distributor, Daniel Gerage. Cayenne is a leading provider of all-natural health and wellness products that provide athletes with faster post-training recovery and energy. Endorsed by professional fighters and celebrity martial artists Josh Tyler, Manny Pacquiao, and Jackie Chan, reach out to Daniel for more info at Cayenne Health Australia at gmail.com or Skype Daniel at that exact same address on Skype, Cayenne, which is K-Y-A-N-I, Cayenne Health Australia at gmail.com. Grandmaster Chuck Platten has been a martial artist for over 40 years. He has black belts in judo, karate, taekwondo, jiu-jitsu, and hapkido. He has combined these styles to create his own system. Grandmaster Platten went on to run his own celebrity security agency and has served as a security specialist and has provided bodyguarding services for the likes of Sophia Loren, Rod Stewart, Celine Dion, Rita Marley, and many more dignitaries over the past 30 years. He serves as a consultant providing training to the armed forces, police forces, and prison guards. Chuck, welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. Thank you, Joseph. Chuck, would you please share the various dans and degrees in black belts which you've earned over the years? Oh, God. <laughs> uh, I started off in Shotokan in 59, Chidoru with Soroka. Uh, I established my fourth dan with uh, Sensei Yes. Um, I started in Jiu-Jitsu and Judo with Frankatashita in the 60s. Then I went to, around 1967, I got into, at that time, there was only one system of Taekwondo. We got into Taekwondo with uh, Master Chum Ki Tae and Jung Park. And then I fell on to Hapkido in 1968 and kind of become a love of my life. And uh, I basically stayed in Hapkido forever, you know, in the midst of that, studying Bando in the Philippines and... Uh, some Panjara Salat in Indonesia, um, Chinese Kempo in Canada, and uh, I'm a grandmaster in Hapkido, and created Chikido Kwan in basically 1978, and finally brought it to the public in 1998. Which is your own system that you still train people on today? Yes, which is you know basically the military police uh, use of force uh, combat art. And Chuck, would you also share with us some of the various stars whom you've provided security for through the years? Oh, so many. Um, I did the Victory Tour with Michael Jackson, the Jackson family. Uh, I did Susan with Celine Dion. I was the head of security. But, uh, actually, I was the person who checked her security. I was hired by a separate company. Um, Paul Diana Ross, Robert Riffer, Ryan O'Neill, uh, Stephen Dorff. Uh, Dennis Quaid, Sharon Stone. I can think of all. Quite yeah. a distinguished list. It goes on or not. <laughs> when you provide security, security for these... Security is a strange field. Security is a strange field. This is true. 
when you provide security for these celebrities, are you basically introduced to them, you know, within a few minutes before you travel somewhere, or do you actually get a chance to establish some rapport with them? Uh, most of it's pre ground laid um, because you, especially if it's a tour, like with Rita Marley, it was the one draw tour, right? So you had X amount of cities, each city is different. You have to go in and pre set everything up uh, prior to switching from city to city. So my job, because I was usually the head of the street, was to go in there and piece everything up beforehand. How did these dignitaries generally receive you? Are they engaging, or are you a, a bit of a ghost to them? Um, some of them I'm a ghost to. Um, a lot of them was hands-on. It depends on what the venue was. Um, if, it was if it was personal VIP, but then you, you know, you're really close, you know, like with uh, Dennis Quaid and Robert De Niro and Sharon Stone and uh, Stephen Dorfer was... Um, Stephen Dorfer, I was the actual chauffeur bodyguard type thing with her, him and Robert De Niro and Dennis Quaid. That was a Disney film that up here in Canada. Um, with Rita Marty, I was actually one of the three bodyguards, personal bodyguards, VIP. Okay. Um, yeah, so it varies. It depends on, like I said, the venue itself. So would you describe for, for the uh, benefit of the listening audience, the, the type of vigilance or attention to detail that's involved in these instances where these people are under your care. Yeah, that varies. You know, it, it's, it's strange to me. It's not like, you know, we live in a violent world, and sometimes the violence is just beyond what most people understand mentally. You know, when you're a star, for some reason, people do some really strange things when you're a public dignitary or a public figure. And it doesn't matter if it's political or entertainment or whatever. And some people um, are under constant threat, right? Or maybe a little paranoid because they've had threats or people that they're friends with have threats. And so it varies between each person on the type of security that they feel comfortable with. You know, a lot of times it'll be, you know, the film, the film industry itself, they'll want a certain amount of protection and stuff. And, not, and it's not always just because of a threat. Sometimes it's just behavioral things making sure, you know, bad stuff doesn't get to the media, so keeping any incidents low profile. And then other times it's um, it's very casual. You're in the background, nobody even knows you're there. Chuck, let's change streams for a minute and talk about the training, the, the training regimen that you've designed for Armed Forces personnel. What does that look like? Ooh, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, it's rough. Um, Armed Forces... Um, Training is a whole different game than the majority of most martial arts people get to see. With with the forces, with any type of forces that you're dealing with anywhere in the world, right? This is lethal force. The bottom line is you're the forces and you're not allowed to lose. So it's your life on the line and you and your partners and your fellow people that you're with and the forces. Their their lives are on the line too. So in essence when you get down to that stage of the game, there's it's nothing pretty, it's nothing fancy, but it's to the point, it's accurate, and it's complete. And if you've got a weak stomach, you're in the wrong business. How would your system compare to the Israeli Defense Forces Krav Maga? Um, they're very, very similar, as a matter of fact. They're um, very, actually very little difference, right? I think, in general, most of the combat force stuff that it's taught worldwide. They kind of take it from everybody. You know, they take some from Sistema and some of them take it from, you know, Grab McGraw, some take it from Hap Kido. I mean, if you've seen, if you've seen the Northern Korean, Korean Army uh, Special Forces to protect the president, you see that it's, the, ba- the basics looks like Taekwondo Hap Kido, and then the weapons part looks absolutely insane. You know, it just, it's, over the top protective. And once again, being the forces, the bottom line is they're not supposed to lose. That's why they're the armed forces. So, Chuck, how does your law enforcement training or differ? Uh, sorry, your law enforcement training differ from the military. Obviously, it's restrictive; it's non-lethal. But how would it differ? Worldwide peace forces all have the same general idea and the general and the general restrictions. It's what is now acceptable by the public is use of force, right? So unlike in the military where you would, this is violent, 
you know, you would bash some guy's head with a, with a gun because you have no choice, right? The, these people are not all lethal criminals. Some of them are just drunk and disorderly and uh, maybe just obnoxious or maybe just, you know, maybe there's somebody who's mentally ill or mentally challenged. Sure. Right? So you can't use that type of force. So a lot of that type of the use of force with police forces is what they call it. One is now camera friendly because it was all caught on the cameras. So you can't go bashing people and strangling people and, you know, shooting them in the head and beating them with your gun. That's just not acceptable by the public. And I agree. Um, so a lot of it is restraint. A lot of it is locks and holds. Um, a lot of it is like, you know, very plain tackle takedown that you see in UFC. You know, um, the idea is the police, the police don't go around beating people up because it's fun. They, they have to restrain them and, and take them into custody because that's the law. That doesn't mean right, that they're going to beat you to death by, to put you in handcuffs. And that's not always easy. So it's, you know, it's a lot of choices between each officer. And when you're teaching, the idea is to teach them how to get the job done as fast as they can without the least amount of energy and the least amount of damage. Okay. That's acceptable. Okay. Chuck, do you provide the same training for prison guards as you would for the police, or would that differ as well? Um, yeah, basically it's, just, it's the same. Um, police, police will have more of, a cha- more of an opportunity to be in violent confrontations than you would uh, at least a violent confrontation because, I mean, there's guns on the street. There's not guns normally in, in corrections uh, within the, you know, the penal system. So the, the biggest probably threat you would have in a penal system would be somebody with a shank or someone with a knife. Okay. Right? And, you know, so you're not really, you're not as arm, in an arm's way as you, as you would be as a law enforcement officer. Law enforcement officers have a tough job. Because, you, you know, it's just unpredictable. You don't know what you're, you know, you'd be walking into a domestic and the guy's got a shotgun. You know, I just, you don't know what's, what's coming until you get there. So the difference in the two is one is more of a ready use of force where, you know, hey, fallout fails, I, can't, I have to put my gun and shoot the guy. And the other is, well, there's enough of us to jump on them and subdue them. So that's basically, what, with one, it's a lot of people, like, especially if you go, like, you know, here in Ontario, which, you know, this is one of the many corrections worldwide, and they call it the ISIS team. It's the team that uh, takes violent uh, uh, guys misbehaving in in the jail cells and stuff like that and to extract them out of, the, out of a jail cell, mm-hmm. right? Technically, it's just a big rush of people and take them to the ground and get them custody. can't hurt himself or anybody else. And then we move them from the cell. Okay. And once again, it's the same idea, right? Trying to do it without hurting them as best you can. Do you generally find that the police you train have already trained in other styles? Very much so. You have been listening to my interview with Grandmaster Chuck Platten. Hi, I'm Bob Wall, a World Full Contact Karate Champion, and I'm the co-star of End of the Dragon. You're listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. Our interview with Bellator fighter Ryan Couture is brought to you by our web marketing affiliates, Everlast, Century Martial Arts, MMA Warehouse, and UFC Store. Check them out at our website at www.mawradio.com. Ryan Couture is an American professional mixed martial artist fighting for Bellator. He is the son of UFC Hall of Famer Randy Couture. Ryan is 34 years of age, normally fights in the lightweight division at 155 pounds, and his styles are wrestling and boxing. He fights out of Las Vegas, Nevada. I spoke to Ryan on the phone as he prepared for his fight against Haim Ghazali at Bellator 180 in New York City. Good afternoon and welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. Good, yourself. Uh, hey, how are you? Doing great, thanks. Thank you so much for joining us. Must be an exciting couple of weeks for you. Oh, absolutely. I'm fired up. And as you get ready for this fight, I mean, there must be a lot of things on your mind, but would you share and you know, reveal those to us, let us in on a little bit of what's going through your mind as you're preparing for this, as opposed to other fights or other endeavors? Uh you know, obviously, it's a it's a huge event, and I'm just thrilled to be a part of it. Um, as as for the fight itself, it, it's there's some interesting challenges because it's my first time up at 170, so trying to get my body used to moving that extra weight around and training with bigger guys than I'm used to, 
uh, getting in shape for that has, has been a lot of work. And, and then, uh, you know, uh, my opponent Heim is, is such a, a specialist on the ground that, that trying to be sharp and be prepared to, to do the right things there and, and, uh, you know, fight him the way I need to fight him has, has been a fun challenge as well. So I feel like I'm, I'm at that point in training camp where, where everything's starting to come together and I'm feeling sharp and, and feeling dialed in. So, so, uh, this is an exciting, uh, exciting couple of weeks coming up. Definitely an exciting couple of weeks. When you're preparing for these fights at this point in time, would you say that you're focusing more on strategy, more on technique, uh, diversity of technique? Where would you position that? Uh, at this point in the training cycle, it's it's kind of focusing in on the techniques that are working and that are and that are are coming together for me and throwing away the excess like uh, at the beginning of camp we have a lot of ideas of things that we think might work and and then uh, I start playing around with them and seeing which ones I'm able to incorporate into my game well and and uh, and able to pull off without having to think too much and 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 really able to execute and and now we kind of have that list narrowed down and and uh, this last hard week of training is just about coming in focused and showing up and, and taking care of business and and uh, you know not not thinking too much, just getting in there and, and performing and, and banging out those last few rounds of sparring that we need and, and rolling into fight week ready to go. Would you consider yourself more of a strategic fighter or do you find that you react more to the situations as they arise in the cage itself? Uh, I think a little bit of both. kind of depends on, on how the fight's going. Obviously, when everything's coming off according to plan, it's a little easier to be strategic, but... but uh, we all know anybody who's thought knows that it's it's not always like that, and a lot of times you do just kind of have to react to what's happening in there and, and be able to adjust on the fly. And, and I think that's uh, that's what makes the difference between guys who are successful and guys who fall short is is who's able to adjust and and uh, and deal with those surprises that are inevitably going to come at you. As you're going through your preparation, I mean, there's no surprises come at everybody, right? And and I know I've spoken to some fighters, both in Bellator and the UFC, that'll say by the night that they step into the cage and they face their opponent, they've already fought that fight in their head or in their imagination a thousand different ways, a thousand different times. So do you find that you tend to get psychologically prepared for these fights or do you tend to try to then just focus more on the technique? Uh, no, I think you have to, you have to have those, those, uh, mental battles and, and, uh, you know, fight that fight in your head over and over to, to really get the reps in. You can't, you can't put in the, the number of repetitions physically that you need to, to really, to really master the game plan and really be prepared without breaking your body down too much. So I think that, you know, having those, uh, those visualization sessions and, and really running through different scenarios in your head over and over is a, is a huge component to, to being fully prepared. Would you tell me a little bit about your preparation in terms of your training partners and, and those, those who are motivating you and who are influencing you? Uh, we've got a, an awesome team here and everybody's really, uh, really stepped up to, to give me the look I need is, uh, the, the, this fight, this, this opponent is a little different style than most of the guys at the gym have. So, you know, getting guys to, to be willing to pull guard and to, and to fish for submissions when they normally, uh, in their training would never do that has, has been kind of, kind of key. And, and, uh, I've had a lot of guys step up and really give me a good look and, and really help me out a lot. So, um, it's, it's been fantastic. I'm lucky to have such a great team around me. When you're looking at, uh, potential opponents or when you're facing your opponents, do you tend to have a preference in terms of, facing an opponent who's a striker versus someone who's strong in a ground game, you prefer to have a, a very well-rounded appro- opponent, or does that thought even enter your mind? Uh, no, I mean, obviously I'd always like to fight someone where I have a clear advantage or a, a, a well-defined path to victory, but but we don't really get to have that much of a say in it most of the time. So so uh, the a big part of the fun and a big part of the challenge of this sport is is looking at that problem that we're posed with when we, when we're given an opponent and trying to, trying to come up with that, that recipe for success and figure out the right way to approach it in order to, to up our odds of, of winning. So, you know, I, I think that that's a big part of the appeal for me and a big part of why I keep coming back is, is that challenge and that problem solving aspect of it. As you start approaching this fight, I mean, Bellator 
is an incredibly exciting organization, and it's just, you know, it's, it's obviously grown in leaps and bounds. Excellent coverage on Spike. How do you feel about the fact that you're now laying down your career and your legacy in Bellator? Oh, I couldn't be happier about it. Um, when I uh, first found my way to Bellator a couple of years ago, it, it really did sort of feel like I was home finally and just just felt so comfortable, obviously, uh, having worked with uh, with Scott and, and everybody back in the Strike Force days gave me that little bit of familiarity coming into it. But there's also a great a great crew of people who've been with Bellator even since before that sort of shift in the management that that are all wonderful people to work with. And uh, it, it's it just feels like uh, feels like family. It feels like coming home every time I get to get get there to check in on Fight Week. And and uh, I couldn't be happier. Uh, kind of feeling like I'm coming into that that last phase of my career, I couldn't be happier with where I've ended up, and I look forward to to finishing out the rest of my fights with Bellator. Do the fight skip routine, or is each one different, and is this one different? Uh, yeah, there are elements of the training cycle that get a little bit, you know, monotonous and, and sort of same old, same old, but, but each opponent is different and presents a different set of challenges and a different... Uh, Set of skills I have to focus on, so so that keeps things interesting. You know, you have you have a a, a new puzzle to solve every time out, and and uh, you know it's it's still a slog getting through eight weeks of, of hard training. Your body's telling you it doesn't want to do anymore, and and, uh, and you're showing up to those two workouts a day and and having to to give it your all, and and that gets to be a bit of a, a grind and a bit of a feel like a bit of a hamster spinning a wheel, but but uh, having just a different a different puzzle to solve a different end result every time is is what keeps it interesting and, and uh, kind of offsets that tedium. And in terms of future goals, after you finish this fight, do you have some longer term plans that you're able to share with us at this point? Uh, I'm just you know looking forward to being a part of this huge event and and uh, you know get, getting back on the winning track. I had a rough year last year, so so I need to get over that hump, get get back in the win column, and, and then I'll be looking to head back to my weight class and, and uh, start climbing my way back up the ranks. Yeah, our final question here, and again, appreciate your candor, and thanks for joining us. A word of advice for those who are now setting their sights on, let's say, transitioning from an amateur to professional. Are there some words of wisdom that you might share with us today? Uh, you know, I think the, the, the biggest thing, especially for the amateur guys, uh, Whenever we have kids here at our gym, you know, kind of making sure that they're they're learning something every time out, and, and win or lose doesn't matter. Your record as an amateur means nothing because no matter what, when you turn pro, you're starting O and O. So not to focus so much on the on the win loss record as an amateur, but just to focus on the process and learning. You know, whether it's you pick up some new tips on how to cut weight better and, and feel better on fight night because of that, or or just getting used to those nerves and managing managing that that. Uh, that nervous energy going into the fight and, and performing on fight night at the level, you know, you can in the gym because you're getting more comfortable out there. Uh, I think focusing on those things more than on the, on the win loss record at, at the amateur ranks is a, is a huge thing that I, that I always try to impart to, to our young up and comers here. Sounds like great advice, sound advice. And want to thank you once again for your time today. It's been a real privilege and we wish you much success on fight night. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's been good talking to you. This has been a telephone conversation with Bellator fighter Ryan Couture. Our interview with world kickboxing legend and martial arts film star Benny the Jet Yurkitas is brought to you by ketone specialist Regan Bremersch. Keto OS is leading a modern health revolution through therapeutic ketone technology. Mix this great natural 100% bioidentical ketone powder into a 16-ounce bottle of cold water for a great-tasting drink for peak performance. Within 15 to 30 minutes, you'll be in the optimal training and fight state of ketosis. He doesn't just say it can do it, he can prove it. For more information, contact Regan at 1204-522-0733 or text him at 1204-522-0733 or visit www.proveittoday.ca. That's www.pruvit number 2 D-A-Y dot C-A. Benny the Jet Yurkidas, born June 20th, 1952, is both a pioneer and a legend in American kickboxing. 
His professional record was 49 wins, one loss. He fought and held world titles in multiple divisions. He holds black belts in eight different styles. And as a martial arts film star and fight choreographer, he has appeared in over 30 productions and has also been a fight trainer to the biggest action names in Hollywood. Benny, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to interview you once again. Thank you much, Joe. Internal martial arts. We discussed this in a previous interview. Would you elaborate on this further? Internal martial arts is about the inner soul. You know, we take a journey and we're learning externally physical movement. And in that, trying to understand a physical movement, a block, a strike, uh, a direction. But truly, what's all, all about internal martial art is about understanding the why, the direction. It gives you the mental edge of understanding why you're doing what you're doing. And so I think internal martial arts, what it does, it brings up emotions that stop us from our better self, or it brings up emotions that help us get through certain things. That's internal martial arts. So would you say a full contact fight, for example, or even a street fight, would uncover emotions that we've never experienced in other aspects of our life? When you're talking about full contact, you're talking about a threat. And when you talk about a threat and you feel threat, whether it be emotional threat, physical threat, spiritual threat, character threat, all brings up things that we hide very well because there's a certain program that's been taught to us to hide very well because showing the emotions of fear, anger, frustration, anxieties, it brings up to where people usually like to take advantage of it. And as they take advantage of it, uh, it actually doesn't come out in a good way. Benny, please share with us your philosophy on the ring as the square jungle. The square jungle is about a metaphor of your home, your work, the place you train, pure people around you. And that square jungle means the energy that comes into that space. And sometimes when energy comes in that's not welcome, what happens is kind of brings up things and triggers things are in us that we hide very well. In the square jungle, what it does, it brings a threat because the square jungle, you have no place to run. It's you and your opponent okay, that's there. So there's almost a trappedness, and you feel trapped because you can't run from it. So you have to answer to this energy, whether it be good energy, negative energy, fun energy, whatever, you're going to have to answer to it. And when you answer to it, whether it be verbal, whether it be mental, whether it be physical, okay, you still have to answer to it. And sometimes it's not as, as pleasant as most people make it out to be. Okay? So in that, bringing out that, that kind of energy that sometimes that we hide because when we feel threatened everything under your bed everything out of your closet everything that you, it, it comes forward because only when you're threatened these emotions you cannot help it shows up and it's sometimes what we fear is about how it looks how it sounds and this is what we fear most people hide that emotion because if it brings up what we've been hiding uh, uh, fear, then it, it sh sometimes it shows up in crying, sometimes it shows up in yelling, sometimes it shows up in freaking out, sometimes it shows up in a way that sometimes we get embarrassed by what it looks like or sometimes we get embarrassed by what we say and we're always... And we always are sorry for it, especially if we don't like it, we're sorry for what we said, and we pay for it later on. Now, you've been in street fights, several street fights, as you shared in the book, The Jet. Are there different emotions that you feel in a street fight as opposed to a fight in the ring? So you're talking about street fight or talking about a fight in a ring. The difference is, the fight in the ring, there's rules. You go by rules. Hey, you can't grab, you can't go to the throat, you can't uh, kick to the knees, okay, and so forth. So there's rules in the square jungle, which is the ring. 
In the street, there is no rules. It's about survival. So the different emotions come out. Is the first thing usually comes out is anger. Okay? Because anger is very easy to show up. It shows up faster than fear. So when that anger comes up and you start striking and you start defending and you start doing whatever out of anger, what follows behind that anger because if you hit somebody and so forth and it doesn't do anything to that person, fear follows behind it like, uh oh, he's going to hit me hard, harder or I'm going to pay for that. And so there's a fear base of am I going to be able to handle what he gives back to me? So it's easy to actually give out. As they say, it's easy to dish it out, but to, to get the return from it, not many people can handle the return. So in the street, uh, it, the reason why the emotions come up faster is because there is no rules and nobody is there to stop it. That's why uh, there's a danger in the street. And even though in the ring there's a danger of being knocked out or being unconscious or having some type of, um, you know, injury to the head, you know, it's not as fearful because there's always, the rules make it more safer than the streets. Now, Benny, in Bruce Lee's book, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do, he wrote about fear and rage and the adrenaline rush. And in his writings, he was saying rather than resist it or be fearful of it or refrain from it, to embrace it, to engage it, and use it as a way to fuel your performance in a fight. How do you feel about that? I feel what Bruce Lee was talking about is to use that kind of emotions to actually benefit from it. But for myself, I know from fighting in a ring and going to third world countries and fighting where there's no rules, I recognize if you use anger, fighting, you become blind. All you see is an object and you're going after it out of anger. And you become a checker player. That means you give them one hit and you'll take three, four, and five. And it doesn't matter to you because you're angry and you're going to stop that person in front of you or the targets in front of you. You want to stop it. So you're not really looking. If it's fearful... And if you, you have a lot of ang I mean a lot of fear while you're in the ring and somebody hits you, it's like having a cold shower. Okay? It's like getting a cold shower and there's this shock goes to your body and it actually stops you from moving forward into protection. And all you're doing is trying to protect yourself by hiding, running, or getting out of the way. So the fear and sometimes they say, Well, the fear sometimes the fear Instead of running away, I run at the person. And a lot of people that, uh, that actually use fear to move them forward, they're actually not hitting target. They're just striking at a person. And they're not hitting target. They're just going and trying to stop that person out of fear. And if it comes to a third stage, which is frustration, is when you start talking to yourself and beating yourself up mentally. And you start telling yourself, what's wrong with me? Come on, I'm looking bad. I'm better than that. I can... And you start saying all these. In other words, a lot of other voices start coming in your head. And all these other voices start putting doubt in you. And then you start getting frustrated. And, the... and you start getting angry at that frustration. But if you go to the stage four, which is anxiety, it means I'm stuck. I can't move. I need somebody to help me get out of it. Either give me something or go to a doctor to give me something to to slow me down or you see somebody your corner man that you trust will help you and, and calm you down to get you out of that anxieties Benny in your book The Jet you shared that when you were younger you got in some trouble with the law and it sounded from your description in the book like you had what we'd refer to as an aha moment you came to some realizations in fact a couple times in your book you mentioned areas where you, in your life and in your journey, where you came to some realizations about things that troubled you about your behavior at that time. You were aware of them, but then you still indulged in that behavior a little longer. 
So at some point in your life, was there a monumental moment where you turned a corner, or was it always a gradual transition for you to get to a more enlightened state? I believe when I was younger, what happens, you get into a stage of not having the experience and being shorter than everybody else. And I've always, for some reason, out of all my family, they always picked me. They always chose me um, to want to fight. And, and so, in that, you know, I believe that we come into this world, our souls come into this world with, you know, my soul. I, I really, deep inside, I really have a good soul. It's just circumstances the physical part when I got challenged is I had no choice but to go out there and defend and then I got to the point where when people challenge they would actually uh, got to the point where I started getting angry at not them I was really believing that I was angry at myself and being angry at myself was very easily to be angry at the world so in that being angry at me taking it out on the world that people that would challenge me it would it'd be easy for me to take it out on them but deep inside when I walked away I didn't feel good about it I never felt good about hurting somebody even if they challenged me even if they the one that started and it doesn't matter because I don't have to say well they started so I finished it and it wasn't about that it was about the fact that I just didn't like myself when I was younger. And when you don't like yourself, it's hard to like anybody else. But, but I knew that after I hurt the person, I walked away not feeling good about it, and I thought, why do I do it? You know, if I don't like the way I feel after I do it, why do I do it? And I can always justify where they started it, they grab me, they push me, they challenge me. Uh, and so I can always justify why I did it, but deep inside I didn't like that feeling until one day, my, uh, as I got older, I started having more experience because I was making money at 15 years old. I was making money when people challenged me. Now, $100 back then, the 60, that's a lot of money for a kid. Sure. And so... When they would put money down and winner take all, you know, I always, you know, hey, it was like, uh, hey, ice cream on me. It was, you know, because to me, the fighting was my least problem. That I can do easily. It seems like I was always a performer since I, since I can remember. It's just I never liked the fact me hurting somebody. I never liked how I felt about it after doing it. Did that change your perspective as a competitor as well? Because when that happened, <clears throat> you were a competitor in martial arts, and you were a champion in martial arts, I believe, in competitive martial arts at that time. So after that incident and experiencing those emotions of going back and reconciling and, and making right, did it change how you looked at competitors when you were fighting in point karate and full contact karate? Actually, when I went to the next tournament, it was the Four Seasons, and I went there, and everybody was looking at me like, they, everybody looked at me and saying, man, you have a smile like you just won the lottery. You know, you, you know what, 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 what's this smile about, you know? And I said, hey, I'm just happy to be here and just, you know, I'm, I'm excited about the competition. But I had a smile from ear to ear. I was so excited. From that point on, I really think that that kid really changed my heart and who I am, the way I look at things. I think that he taught me such a lesson that I realized that I didn't have. I didn't really have to be with such... I can do the same thing I was doing, but with out of love and such fun and, and not have to... Uh, nothing changed. I was jump kicking, dropping people, this and that back. But I was having such a good time because my attitude in doing it was, was out of love and fun, what I love doing. 
Invaluable life lessons. Benny, thank you once again for taking the time to speak with us, and all the best to you. My pleasure in all this listening. Truly, that is what they call internal training. This has been a conversation with the great Benny the Jet Yukitas. Be sure to check us out at www.mawradio.com and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube by following Martial Arts World Radio. I'm Joseph Clark. Thank you for listening.